Hi friends, my name is Trish Roberts and you're watching Faint Signals from Vega. So, as some of you might know, um, I do a regular live stream and um, on it's a vegan live stream and um, some might wonder who are not vegan why I do these live streams um, and for the same reason that I um, that I oppose war, that I oppose racism and sexism, heterosexism, etc. Because it's unjust. Animal exploitation is unjust and it's violence and it's otherizing a group based on an irrelevant criterion species. And um, so that's, and what, what might motivate me? Um, you might ask. Um, well, every day, of course, I'm surrounded um, by animal exploitation, living in rural Tasmania. Whoops. I just realized I didn't have my, um, um, my microphone on. That's not going to be very helpful. So, um, so I, as uh, I'll go back to the beginning, um, I, I, um, I do regular live streams on Real, Real Progressives, and uh, they're usually uh, vegan live streams. And you might ask, um, uh, you know, and, and I, I do them because uh, I reject um, injustice and I, I, I promote nonviolence. So I, 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 I do the vegan live streams for the same reason that I'm against war, that I'm against uh, racism and sexism, heterosexism, and other forms of discrimination. Um, based on an irrelevant criterion, which in this case is species, is speciesism, is species. I, I reject um, speciesism and I reject the use of non-human animals for food, clothing, entertainment and other reasons. And um, you might ask what motivates me to, to do that, to do these live streams, uh, particularly, you know, if um, when, you know, basically animal use is pervasive and it's everywhere um, and animal products are everywhere so you know most of us are consuming animal products which are the bodies and secretions of non-human animals and we're wearing them on our bodies as well wool silk leather fur um, and you know we we see animals as entertainment sometimes as well so basically they're viewed as property and resources and entertainment. So, um, so what motivates me every day is is uh, seeing non-human animals, seeing animal products, and knowing they were once sentient beings. But also, um, uh, for example, the other day I was I drive along the river. I live in Tasmania, and uh, I pass by um, along the Huon River on the way home. And every day I pass by a small mum and pup farm, um, which is um, has geese and ducks on it. And it's quite an ideal, idyllic kind of a situation. They're across the road from the river. Um, they, they have um, a sort of a pond there where all the ducks and geese are. The ducks and geese don't attempt to leave the area because they're domesticated. They get fed. And they see the, um, their captors, their exploiters as, uh, their friends who feed them. Uh, so, you know, that's why they don't leave, um, because they see, they trust the people that, uh, feed them. And one day I was driving by there. I always, often feel sad when I drive by there because I know that, um, they probably supply restaurants. They probably also supply people who will use them uh, in some way or even kill them. Uh, and so, you know, they see these non-human animals as a way to make a profit. And I sort of drive by there and I see them and they're, you know, they're, there's a lot of them. And one day I drove by there and there was a, a ute and it had about five or six of, um, I think it was geese, or ducks, um, I'm, I, I was in a distance, but I could see that they had hoods on them, so hoods on the animals. And I guess part of that was probably to keep them calm when they're driving 
along, uh, you know, a highway to wherever they're taking them, possibly to have them killed. I don't know. Um, and it was very sad. It was sort of like watching individuals being hooded up to be taken to being executed. And it may be the case that they're actually taken along to possibly a restaurant even or to somewhere to be killed and they probably never ever see the light of day. They probably, or they may have their, um, those hoods removed and then they have their, um, they're killed. So, you know, it's terribly sad, these sweet animals, um, you know, and all for what? For basically taste pleasure because we don't need animal products to survive. As I say, regularly we can, we can easily meet all our nutrition requirements from plants and other non-animal sources. So all of this, all of this tremendous violence, the one trillion land and aquatic animals who are tortured and killed every year, all of this is for trivial reasons of mostly palate pleasure. And hi to those who've uh, joined in. Hi, Lydia. Hi, Patty. And anybody else who joins. Um, it's very early in the United States um, on the East Coast at present, but I live in the Southern Hemisphere. And um, at this time of year, it's my busy time. And so I have to fit um, in these live streams when I can, being summer and all that I have to do. So, but as I was saying, um, you know, the, these animals are, being used for trivial reasons of habit, convenience, tradition. Um, we had, you know, just recently um, uh, the, well, some would call it Thanksgiving. Indigenous people would call it something else, but it's a tradition where, you know, millions of turkeys are tortured and killed. Uh, and, you know, and this is for Thanksgiving, celebrating something over the tortured body and killed you know, bodies of sentient beings, which is sort of something that's very sad as well. But, you know, this is the thing. So I pass by this, um, you know, farm every day and I see those animals that trust the captors um, who feed them every day. And then one day they're put into the back of a ute or a van or something with hoods over their heads and taken off to whoever, know, you know, whatever. But eventually they'll be killed anyway. Um, so, so that's that's the so-called idyllic and quote unquote humane farming, um, where you know. And then there's also I, I was speaking to a checkout person uh, who I regularly see uh, when I go to the supermarket, you know. And she she's not vegan, and um, you know she says in her lunchtime she goes down to feed um, uh, a. I think it's a rooster that's been dumped by the side of the road. Um, fortunately, there's grass and some uh, water available. There's a, like a, a creek. And uh, this rooster is by himself, but I'm sure there'll be others because that's usually what happens. People that have backyard chickens tend to um, sometimes you know, the chickens mate and then they have roosters and they have no need for roosters because they use them, the animals for eggs. And so they, you know, when they realize that one of their chicks is a rooster, they just um, dump them by the side of the road or take them into a forest or they kill them. So this particular rooster, and you could probably call it, call this rooster, quote unquote, lucky because he uh, was not killed but he's by himself and he has to fend for himself and there are animals who uh, probably would attack him if they saw him. And so, you know, that's what happens. This is the so-called quote-unquote humane farming, uh, which has, ca you know, it has casualties and it has victims as well. And eventually, you know, um, he is one of the lucky ones in quotes because he wasn't killed, but he's been abandoned and he might be killed by um, an animal and or he might be uh, poisoned by, um, you know, the council because, you know, they're not prepared to, they, they just eventually if there's an, enough of them, they'll do something like that or something else. They, they trap them and then give them to uh to who knows to who knows what i mean it's it's this is the sad reality you know whether industrialized farms or mom and pop farms that's what happens so um 
you know, when, when uh, you know, people might ask, you know, what motivates me to, to do vegan live streams or, and vegan education in general, it's just knowing that there are so many victims every second of every day and for completely unnecessary reasons of mostly pallet pleasure because um, most of the animals killed today are for food. Uh, so, and, and we don't need animal products to survive, as, as I've said. So, um, you know, that's just one of the many, many um, examples of um, what motivates me because I really hope that one day we have a vegan world um, because there'll be so many benefits to that. Ancillary benefits are, there's a long, long list um, to, from climate change, addressing climate change, to, um, you know, to the antibiotic resistant bugs that um, happen um, as a result of mainly animal agriculture. There's a whole lot of reasons. And of course, the health reasons are numerous. But, um, you know, my, my reason for, for promoting veganism, the ethical position, is because non human animals are not our resources. And we need to see the sentience that's very obvious that we ignore because it's convenient to do so. So um, now I wanted to share with you, if I may, um, an essay. It's a very short one from Gentle World. Uh, Gentle World's given me permission to share essays. And uh, I think that you'll find it interesting. Um, I'm very, um, I'm, I'm very grateful there are so many excellent non-speciesist vegans in the world. And when I say non-speciesist vegans, I don't mean that I'm not speciesist in some way because just like uh, when you're a white person born into a society where white people are privileged, you cannot, you know, cannot help but have some sort of um, racism within you just by being a privileged member of society, a white person, and all the, structu the structured benefits that that come from that and when one is born into a speciesist society which we all are um, it's rampantly speciesist and animal use is everywhere it's impossible to to not be constantly addressing one's own speciesism but of course the the best way to do that uh, you know the initial and best way to do that is to to go vegan and stop using them as resources uh, so but this uh, particular essay I think you might find um, interesting. It's called Opposition Confirms My Purpose. And here's a quote from um, Frederick Douglass, who was an abolition, oh, sorry, William Lloyd Garrison from July 14th, 1830. Quote, I found the minds of the people strangely indifferent to the subject of slavery. Their prejudices were invincible, stronger, if possible, than those of the slaveholders. Objections were started on every hand. Apologies for the abominable system constantly saluted my ears. Obstacles were industriously piled up in my path. What was yet more discouraging, my best friends, without an exception, besought me to give up the enterprise. It was not my duty, they argued, to spend my time and talents and services where persecution, reproach and poverty were the only certain reward. My scheme was visionary, fanatical, unattainable, but opposition served only to increase my ardour and confirm my purpose, end quote. So that's William Lloyd Garrison from 1830. So we live in a world where the vast majority of people consider it perfectly acceptable to oppress and exploit other animals, despite the fact that we have no moral justification for doing so. Every year in the United States, approximately 10 billion plus land animals are killed after being intentionally bred and enslaved, all for human gain. Worldwide, the numbers equal approximately one trillion land and aquatic animals, and that's a conservative estimate if we count animals who live in the water. There are tens or hundreds of billions more every year. All these animals are as innocent as children, 
but we treat them as though being born as a member of a different species is a crime worthy of life in prison, often accompanied by torture ending with the death penalty. In fact, for the vast majority of them, the lives they are forced to live are so unbearable that premature death itself, a severe harm, might conceivably serve as some kind of merciful release from a life of physical, psychologically, and emotional suffering. Widespread veganism is the only hope these non-human beings have for emancipation from their brief, brutal existence. Such a fundamental change in our society will only be brought about by a radical moral paradigm shift similar to those which resulted in the abolition of human chattel slavery and the voting rights of women. Moral paradigm shifts, however, do not cause themselves. They are caused by small groups of people within society, always considered radical in their own time, who persistently educate over decades about why change is necessary. Indeed, William Lloyd Garrison founded The Liberator, a weekly anti-slavery newspaper in 1831, and it wasn't until after 34 years and the bloodiest war on United States soil that slavery was finally abolished in 1865. Similarly, the women's suffrage movement, first well-known spokesperson was John Stuart Mill in 1865, but women were not permitted to vote until 1918 in the United Kingdom and 1920 in the United States. Note that William Lloyd Garrison, the author of this, authors and the authors of this article, reject violence and support only non-violent education and reasoned dialogue as a means to social justice, regardless of the cause. In their efforts to educate and engage in civil disobedience in the name of noble causes, abolitionists and suffragists endured ridicule, anger, imprisonment, and death threats, both from the establishment itself and also from counter-movements made up of citizens with an interest in maintaining the current situation. Nobody minded a quiet abolitionist or suffragist, respecting, quote, everyone's personal choice, end quote, with deference silence was deemed, quote, moderate and respectable, end quote, by those vested in the status quo. Challenging the injustice with moral education was called, quote, self-righteous, end quote, quote, offensive, end quote, quote, unquote, extremist, and quote, unquote, off-putting. Take, for example, the following quote from 1847, in which human slavery proponent Joseph W. Lassin criticizes anti-slavery advocates and the abolitionist movement. Quote, the abolitionists conduct, con conduct, the abolitionists' conduct has been most atrocious. No language is strong enough to denounce it. The shameless impudence with which they have trampled the Constitution under their feet and the mean and despicable contrivances to deprive us of our slave property ought to be held up to the scorn of the whole union, end quote. The more direct and unequivocal an advocate's position, the more resistance he or she encountered. And so it is with vegans today, despite the fact that we stand so clearly on the side of justice for all sentient beings, we can expect to encounter resistance most of the time. As strong vegan educators and advocates, we can expect to be dismissed, ignored, misrepresented, and to be subjected to whatever treatment those opposing us believe would be most effective at discouraging our efforts. Recognizing and accepting this situation for what it is and realizing that other successful social justice movements faced similar resistance and criticism over the spans of decades can help us persist in our efforts over the decades as well. Aside from simply being on the justifiable side of a cause, a major reason that social justice movements of the past succeeded was persistence, 
Realizing that even the most effective vegan advocacy will take decades rather than months or years to have its intended goals achieved can give us this perspective we need to ultimately succeed by avoiding the burnout that comes with the obsessive activity, unrealistic expectations and a short-sighted focus on short-term results. We should recognize that it might sometimes be beneficial to take a break and recharge our batteries, and that alongside our personal advocacy, it's important that we also strive for physical, mental and emotional health so that we can be as effective as possible in our efforts to educate and inspire others. So let us relentlessly persist in the struggle for justice at a pace we can maintain for as long as, ne as is necessary. Let us not measure our progress in insignificant welfare quote-unquote victories, which during the short time they last only serve to perpetuate the exploitation paradigm and make consumers feel better about their purchases of animal products. Let us instead measure progress in terms of the increasing number of ethical vegans that decreases in animal, the decreases in animal product consumption, the increases in vegan, vegan alternatives, and the gradual transformation of the collective consciousness, which only 65 years ago didn't even have a word to describe someone as being vegan. Over time, the irrepressible power of justice will prevail as we overcome the shameful prejudice and despicable discrimination that attempts to justify and maintain the moral status of animals as economic property and tradable commodities. Until that day comes, let whatever opposition come our way serve only to increase our ardor and confirm our purpose. Drawing on the wisdom of another of the great voices of the anti-slavery movement of the 1800s, Frederick Douglass, quote, those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate ag agitation are people who want crops without plowing the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the roar of its many waters. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. So that was from uh, Gentle World from 2011. And Gentle World is an inten a vegan intentional community that's trying to bring peace to the world. And I think that's something that we could all do with. We certainly could do with a lot less violence in the world. And when we consider how much violence goes on with our animal product consumption every second of every day, literally thousands of animals every second in the world are being tortured and killed for mostly trivial reasons. So this is something that, um, you know, we can think about um, and think about, um, think about it in a way, just try and put aside what we think about non-human animals. We've been indoctrinated to think of them as animals that are on this earth for us to use. That's how we've been indoctrinated to think about it. And with every every um, social justice cause, it requires a sort of a, an awakening to a particular, to open our mind to something that we've been told over and over again by our families and friends, by society. And what we've been told over and over again, right from when we were born, is that animals are here for us to use. They're here for us to uh, for our entertainment and for to eat and all of that. That's that's what we're told right from right from when we're um, old enough to understand. It's 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 put into our consciousness, and it becomes like breathing. And so when somebody says something that counters that belief, we'll make all sorts of irrational. Um, uh, excuses in our mind and also some of us might even react in a very negative way or an angry way because when when our belief systems are challenged it can be very confronting for people 
And sometimes it takes a while for to break through that sort of indoctrination. Um, but it's it's okay. It's the world isn't going to fall apart if we suddenly stop using animals, if each one of us stops um, eating, wearing, and using animals. Economies go on. Um, people will, you know, like as in slavery, economy, the economy didn't fall apart, even though it was heavily reliant on humans as property, using humans as property. But economies went on and they found other ways, unfortunately, um, neoliberalism and capitalism is pretty awful. But I mean, the, the countries, countries didn't fall apart uh, when human slavery, legal human slavery, even though, of course, that's on the rise again today, but we're talking about a few hundred years ago. Uh, you know, people survived and they, they move on. And this is the same with animal slavery, which is the 21st century legal slavery. Economies will go on. Economies are already adjusting to the increase in veganism. Um, in fact, you know, I see it every day when I search online just for the word vegan, there's, uh, you know, this the market meets demand and it doesn't matter what that demand is often, but there are more vegans in the world and economies are adjusting to that. So, you know, this is the thing. Um, we, it's a win-win for us. We, be, we have a more nonviolent world if we become vegan. We have, uh, we address climate change, 51% of greenhouse gases and all that that means, including the climate refugees and, uh, bacteria resistant, uh, sorry, um, antibiotic resistant superbugs, um, the Amazon rainforest being destroyed, world, you know, world hunger because lots of countries that are very poor are growing grain to ship overseas to feed animals in feedlots in the West and they, they're starving themselves. There are so many reasons. It's a win-win. But the most important reason, which I always say, and this is what veganism is, is the most important reason is we're enslaving and killing and terrorizing 99% uh, 99.99% of the planet's population who are non-human. And if an alien were to visit this, this planet, they'd probably, if they had any sense of justice at all, they'd probably be horrified at what we're doing to most of the planet's population. So, you know, we've become a, we, we have a lot of good in us as a species, but we also have a lot of dysfunction. And until we address that dysfunction, which is often, which is usually um, might makes right, um, oppressing those that are vulnerable, and we see it, we oppress humans who are vulnerable, minority groups, um, groups that we vilify so we can go and take their resources um, through war. You know, we we have this tendency as a species uh, to, to, um, to dominate and oppress. And uh, the easiest group to do so, even though it's the greatest group, uh, is non-human animals because they can't really resist us. So we don't want to, we really don't want to, do we, to, to, to uh, terrorize and oppress a group because they can't resist us. I mean, that's, that's the, that's a sort of a bullying behavior and it's kind of cowardly. So, you know, we need to think about that. We wouldn't, uh, if we saw an animal in distress on the street, hopefully, or well, most of us would want to intervene. And that includes animals that we use as resources on our plates. You know, if we saw, you often hear people uh, intervening when they see an animal that's fallen off a truck or a truck that's capsized, you know, that's crashed and, and there are animals that were on their way to a slaughterhouse and people will be trying to save them or an animal that's escaped a slaughterhouse. People will be cheering them on to get away and then people want to see them safe in a sanctuary. We really inside, we think animals morally matter. We really do. Inside our hearts and heads, we recognize their sentience. We believe they morally matter. And so that's why we do that. That's why uh, most of us do care when we see animals, e even the animals that are domesticated that we are eating. When we see them, you know, in distress, 
or we see them in an ideal, you know, in these so-called idyllic pastures, which are just waiting rooms basically until they're until they can be killed. They're basically just waiting pastures. And when we see them there, we think, aren't they beautiful? And, uh, you know, we, we have this connection to other animals because we are animals. Um, people like to pretend that we're not, but we are. We're animals. We've, we've evolved. Uh, unless you're a creationist, we've evolved from, uh, and we've become, we are other animals. We just have a different, we have a difference to other animals. All animals have special um, abilities that, that we don't have as humans, and we have special abilities that they don't have. But that doesn't make them lesser if they're not like us, just as groups that are different races or different gender um, identities, different sexual orientations, doesn't make them lesser because they're different. It just makes them different. And we, when we start to really embrace diversity, um, that's when things will really change. So what we do to non-human animals is just, is just part. Uh, it doesn't stay in a vacuum. It's just part of what we're doing to humans you know, the the dominant groups are doing to minority groups that are different or doing to races that we want to take their resources so we vilify them and otherize them. You know, so this otherization is a real problem for our species, otherizing, um, you know, sort of diff otherizing groups or another species simply because they're, an, you know, different to us. So that's, you know, that's really what I'm trying to say here is, um, you know, veganism is just, it's an ethical position just like any other ethical position, just like anti-racism or anti-sexism and so forth. It's, an, it's not a diet. It's not extreme. It's not purist. It's not any of those things. It's an ethical position, and that's what I try to get across every time I do a vegan live stream. And um, so that's really what I wanted to say. And um, I don't really have much more to say. I hope to do another vegan live stream soon. I thank you very much for watching. Um, and uh, uh, I hope that you'll uh, you feel free to subscribe to my site because I do other um, issues as well on faint signals from Vega. But um, uh, the mo one, well, the most important one to me is veganism. But it's all related, isn't it? Anti-war, anti-imperialism, veganism. They're all, they're all related because we're all interconnected. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. My name's Trish Roberts. You're watching Faint Signals from Vega. Till next time. Bye for now.